Welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Ottinger, and we've been talking about the Song of Deborah. We're in the series called A Mother in Israel, because that's what Deborah calls herself. And we started this story back at the Battle of Megiddo, how it began, what the situation was. We followed it to the end of Sisera's life at the hands of JL. I don't know what the feminine equivalent of like homeboy would be, but like <laughs> homegirl. Homegirl. I, uh, I don't know. Mm. I think that's a different connotation. I don't know. Mm-hmm. In any case, we we heard about JL last week, and now we're coming back to look at the song of Deborah. She emphasizes a few different things in her song. Uh, the first of which is the nature of the battle. This is not merely political. There are darker forces at work here. Um, We're talking about the oppression of the people of God and the potential obliteration of the messianic line. Am I on the right track here, Greg? Uh, Yes. Given that the Bible is about Jesus, (laughs) you know, that, that may have come across the wrong way because there are a lot of Christians who don't actually quite get that. In many cases, because they've never been instructed, they they look at the Bible. And it's a big, long, thick book, and they're kind of like lame is. Yeah, um, <laughs> and we start and off with these chapters that have nothing to do with Jean Valjean, and there's no music in it at all. There's, yeah, people don't I, burst you know, out into that. I yeah, I, the, the priest I always thought was a great character. I was sorry to see him go and realize he's yeah. not even a main character. <laughs> but which, which you know, which which brings us to Genesis, oddly enough, where you 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 spend multiple chapters with some of these people, and then they die. Mm-hmm. Uh, my my own Emily, my daughter, when she was two, I was reading Genesis with her, and this of course was brand new to her in the most literal sense. But we've been reading a little bit of every night. And I asked her one night, so what happened last night? And we said, Daddy, Abraham, he, Abraham died. Oh. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, it's real literary experience. She had gotten familiar with this guy and didn't realize that, hey, there, there's a lot to the book that goes way beyond this. <laughs> but Jesus is never absent from its pages in one way or another. He's the one speaking, of course, something we need to remember. It's the spirit of Christ to inspire the prophets. And he's the theme. And there are countless literary and historical allusions to him. And historically, the book is moving toward his coming. And everything along the way is preparing the way for his coming. And so when we come to this, we don't necessarily need to have big flashing road signs that say Messiah up ahead. (laughs) We just need to remember what this book is about. There's this promised seed but there's also this serpent, and the serpent wants to uh, possess the woman, bring forth her his own seed through her, and wants to devour the promised seed. Whereas the mother wants to preserve the seed until he can reach maturity and crush the living daylights out of the serpent. Well, that's kind of what we have here. The fo- usually, the focus through the prophets is on some male hero, a prophet, a king, a priest, judge, some combination. And we see them imitating Christ, preparing the way for Christ, but always falling short of the measure of Christ because Mm -hmm. none of them is Christ. But every now and then, God throws the the spotlight over on the woman, both as a rebuke to men in their faithlessness and their immaturity and their laziness, but also in true praise of godly women everywhere of what they can do and in fact do as they honor their callings. Now, we've already seen Deborah in jail. They were honoring their callings, but this woman was a judge. What's with that? Yeah, God called her. She's a prophetess. Get over it. <laughs> um, and jail, well, she she got all violent and physical with a, a hammock and, and, and a tent spike. Those were her normal everyday tools. No different from a woman picking up an iron skillet in her kitchen and smashing the rapist who just climbed through the window. But the issues are much, much higher. We're dealing with this Canaanite culture. Now, at this point, Israel is is divided among the 10 tribes. Down toward the south, Judah has its own problem with the Philistines. And so Judah's not going to come into the storyline. And of course, Judah carries the promise. But Judah's not going to stand up to everybody on their own. So what, although what happens in the north isn't as directly a threat, if the north goes down, 
Judah's going to be hindered by the Philistines on one side, the Canaanites on the other, and things are not looking good here. So we are fighting for the promise. The other thing we need to remember about Canaanite culture is that it was truly demonic. Mm-hmm. Now, we're, we're used to using those words flippantly, and we sometimes need to go through all the uh, the references in the law and the Psalms and in Paul that, that say, no, in certain terms, no, they worship demons. Mm-hmm. It's not just that it was really bad, and we're going to use the word demonic because it's so bad. Yeah. No, they Or weird were, or creepy. <laughs> weird or creepy, yeah. yeah. No, these, these are fallen angels posing as gods, sometimes working miracles or um, presenting false oracles, by which they con the local natives into all kinds of wicked behavior, including child sacrifice, self-mutilation, all kinds of weird, gross things. But particularly at this point, the demons see, oh, promise. This thing, this this person who's supposed to come and crush us all, he's in the womb of one of these women. If we can wipe them out, oh, and we have handy tools. These Canaanites are mean and nasty and have no regard for women anyway. So we got this one. Hmm. And here we have Deborah and Barak, a woman, older woman, a judge, a prophetess, in an unusual but not prohibited role by any means. And can and, I pause and yeah. just pick sure. up something you yeah. put right there? It was um, God didn't hide his plan from Satan. No. <laughs> he announced it to him in the very beginning. And so then when Jesus comes, you have all these demons saying, oh, we know who you are. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Oh, it's you. We've been waiting for <laughs> yeah. you, unfortunately. And you're, oh, you're here. This is not good. <laughs> uh, we, we thought we had you earlier and uh, you're here. So um, I'm not sure what the lower downs are saying about this one, but oh, I have to leave, do I? Okay, I'll go screaming <laughs> and kicking. Uh, boy, wait till I report this back down below. And they, uh, I hope the boss has a plan because this is not looking good. <laughs> But, you know, we, we look at Jesus casting out demons, and it is important to remember that's a, a, a climax of, what is the word I'm looking for? It, it's it's the story coming into its fullness. It's not really a new element. There have always been demons in the background. Mm-hmm. We'll think of Elijah's uh, confrontation with the prophets of Baal, where the text says that there was none to hear, none to answer. And we say, well, of course not, Baal's not real. No, that's not the point. There were demons, and God shut their mouths. Mm-hmm. And so here, there are demons in the background that are worshipped under the title of Baal. They're, they're nature, the forces of nature. And Lewis has a whole lot to say about the time when men begin virtually worshipping the for- forces of nature while, while denying the existence of God. <laughs> he said the materialist magician is Satan's final handiwork. But it, since our last broadcast, actually, it occurs to me that that's actually where he started. He convinced mm-hmm. these people to be secularists and magicians at the same time. There's no mm-hmm. personal God. They're just forces, but we can use magic to control them. Well, that's where our <laughs> culture has been heading ever since the 60s, if not if not sooner, Lewis or saw it in the 40s, Yeah, the fusion of technology and magic. So that's what's going on in this battle. It's it's it, Most people don't even know the Battle of Megiddo. Uh, they might know about Deborah if their Sunday school's even teach it, they, they would know about jail because it's a nice, bloody, cool story <laughs> when the children are apt to remember. But often it doesn't get taught because it's too bloody and we don't want our children disturbed by vicious images. Uh, the Song of Deborah, I don't know if anybody knows that. And and yet it, this this thing gets, gets multiple chapters here. It's two, is it just two, just two chapters, but it falls into two parts. It's the the initial battle and then it's, Jail taking out Sisera, and then it's a song of of Deborah, which does take up an entire chapter and is the only chapter in scripture written by a woman. It is so long that it gets to be a chapter. So this this is a huge thing in the history of redemption. Judah's busy with the Philistines. Northern tribes have her back, one hopes. But uh, if if the north goes down, if the north doesn't stand against the Canaanites, or if the Canaanites overwhelm them, then Judas hemmed in and the promise is hanging by a thread. And humanly speaking, it would look impossible at that point. Uh, and, and, and so when Deborah sings the song of victory, that's what's in the background. And we need to understand that. I, I, I think that sometimes, well, you know, here's a thought. Back in the 60s, when Vietnam was a thing, for the first time we saw on 
television, and I was a very small child at the time, but we saw the violence of war. American cameramen went in behind the soldiers, our soldiers, and filmed over their shoulders. And what do you see? You see American soldiers shooting bad guys. Well, they're bad guys if the reporters happen to mention that they're bad guys. But we're seeing war in all of its ugliness. And, and there was a revulsion against that. And it, it, the TV coverage helped the anti-war effort, for good or ill, however you take that. But I think we've come full circle. We've got to the point where we see war on TV and in uh, video presentations and video games to the point that, you know, we've been fighting a war. Uh, my, my daughter Emily, again, asked mom not terribly long ago, well, actually several years ago, I guess. Mom, how long has the war been going on? Because Emily could not remember a time when we weren't at war. This went on and on and on. And I confess that I got um, anesthetized to it, dull to it, because I don't watch um, um, late night, or, uh, what's the word? Regular Cable TV. Cable news. Yeah. I don't, I don't watch that. I don't watch um, normal evening news broadcasts. I don't watch any of that kind of stuff. And so for me, it was very easy to forget and not make it the, the important priority it is. And I think in part, and this is, this is speculation, feel free to throw in your own perspective here, that perhaps when we come to these battle scenes, since we are a culture that has not seen war on our soil mm -hmm. since the Civil War, really, unless you live in Hawaii, we don't get it. We don't get what, it, what it's like to live in a battle zone. Yeah. And so when Deborah is celebrating liberation from that condition of, of, of ongoing war, the enemy's been oppressing them for, what is it, 20 years? Yeah. But um, we've also cheapened the word war oh, because yeah. we've got the war on drugs. We've got the war on poverty. Like a friend of mine once said, hold on, there's war and then there's poverty, <laughs> right? <Yeah. laughs> there are two different scales of fighting for survival. Not that poverty is anything to laugh at. It's it's not but fun. It's, sure, it's not addressed the same way or by the same means. Right, you, you can't spend money and make it go away. Although right. you would think you could. <laughs> it's poverty. Let's just give everybody money. It turns out it doesn't work that way. But that's a topic for another time. Yeah. So with that, then we come to Deborah singing. Uh, it says that uh, Deborah and Barak sang, but all of the. Uh, the speaking verbs are feminine. So apparently she's doing the singing. It's her song. It's, it's by divine inspiration. Barak is probably either providing uh, a musical accompaniment. He's the Levite from hmm. the mythical city. Or maybe doing some background. Yeah, yeah. Or whatever. It's, you know, the <laughs> harmony. Was in the, harmony, whatever the equivalent was. Uh, antiphonal responses. Uh, but it, it is important to remember it is prophecy. Uh, because... New Testament Christians come and look at this and say, this does not sound like, this does not sound like my Jesus. Well, that may tell you something <laughs> about your Jesus then. Because mm -hmm. not only is Jesus Jehovah God, who keeps getting referred to, it's also the angel of the Lord who says something very shocking at one point. We'll get to that eventually. Mm -hmm. So, just kind of um, reading through text and, and please jump in. Oh, we should tell people. Yes, Brian is still alive. He's just oh, not yes. with us tonight. <laughs> yes, he's getting, he's getting ready to get married. Yeah. <laughs> he's a little busy. <laughs> <laughs> we wish him well and hope yeah. that he will be back before too long. Yes. Uh, yeah, it, it always, I don't know how many times you may have watched a TV series when suddenly some major character just vanishes without explanation. Yeah. And then they replace it with somebody <laughs> inferior. Yeah. <laughs> of course. It's annoying. That happened more times than I can count in the Andy Griffith show, to be honest. <laughs> in the only five seasons that exist. Yeah. Uh, and, and there was a time, I remember on a, one of my mom's soap operas, where they literally kept the character and switched out the actor. Oh, the only, right. the only uh, acknowledgement was, today the role of blah, blah, will be played by blah, blah, blah. <laughs> that was it. And it, from there on, just they told us we have to accept it, and that's that. <laughs> and you always wonder... Was there some ill will? Did he do something horrible? Is he rob a bank or yeah. conspire against the government? And, and, and no one ever tells you. Right. Um, Have you seen the uh, the A and E Worcester and Jeeves uh, with Hugh Laurie and yeah. Stephen Fry? Oh yeah, yeah. They oh, yeah, do yeah, that. Yeah. I mean, that has only what 
three or four seasons, yeah. but they keep recycling the side characters, like oh, the, yes. all the same actors, but they play different they play roles. Different roles yeah. But it's so <laughs> funny because like you get to the final season and it's like off. Everybody's finally where they should be <laughs> character wise. <laughs> but anyway, that's the oh. counter example that proves the rule. Yeah. Okay. And all that had to do with Brian. So just right. letting people yeah. know, we are not on the outs with Brian. Brian is fine. And we're, we're hoping he comes back. Yeah. Uh, but if he, if married life proves too difficult, we will tell you that. <laughs> yeah. Not simply vanish into the sunset. Or <laughs> the role of Brian will now be played <laughs> by. <laughs> oh. That would not go well. There's no replacing Brian. There's no replacing Brian. Okay. So praise ye the Lord for the avenging of Israel. Wow. Avenging of Israel. Uh, God's people have been wronged most egregiously by these Canaanites, and God has stepped in as their kinsman redeemer or as the avenger of blood. He's He has that covenant relationship with his people, and uh, he's going after their enemies. And this is not the petty kind of vengeance that we sometimes feel. I need to get even. He slighted me. I must repay. This is God. This is God's holy justice, and this is God's redeeming love. Uh, saying, they're my people. You don't get to do that to them. When the people willingly offered themselves, uh, God is at work, God is the initiator, God is sovereign. And yet, because of that, not in spite of that, many of God's people willingly offered themselves for battle. In the wake of 9-11, we had a lot of young men and young women who willingly volunteered for the military. And, and the that's kept up to some extent, but that didn't used to be the way. After Vietnam, no one wanted to join the military because the war had left such a black eye uh, on the whole idea of war and our military service. We couldn't. There, there was there was a long time there where in our culture you didn't you didn't become a soldier if you did you were really weird and questionable. But then why aren't you we in were, college instead? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Don't you want a future? But in the wake of nine eleven, then there was this change. Uh, when, is there not a cause, as David would say? They op the people willingly offered themselves, Hear, O ye kings, give ear, O ye princes. She's, she's talking to the Canaanite nations round about. The, the Canaanites proper, but then the Moabites and the Amorites, the Ammonites and even the Philistines. Everyone who eventually will hear this. I even, I will sing unto the Lord. I will sing praises to the Lord God of Israel. This is the focus of her song. This is not to brag about how great she is or how barbaric or even Israel. This is not in that sense. Our nation is so tough. Woo, woo, woo. <laughs> this, this, this it's is not praise. a national anthem. It's not a national anthem. It's praise to God. I will sing praise to the Lord God of Israel. Lord, and the word Lord throughout here mostly is in the King James. It's in all caps. That means it's Jehovah or Yahweh. I am covenant name of God, which is important here, that mm -hmm. this is God who is faithful and keeps his promises and doesn't change. When thou wentest out of Seir, when thou marchest out of the field of Edom, the earth trembled and the heavens dropped, the clouds also dropped water, the mountains melted from before the Lord, even that Sinai from before the Lord God of Israel. She's going back to the giving of the law, to the, the original as it were, incorporation of Israel into a kingdom as opposed to um, a patriarchy, she can kind of thing, as a nation of a kingdom of priests. And when the when Israel looked, they saw apparently they saw the Shekinah glory coming from due north, which which would be from Canaan through Edom and settling on Mount Sinai. That's the references to Syria and Edom. Hmm. And it was spectacular. It's like the very heavens were bowing down. There was Rain, something that isn't mentioned in most of the passages. We're, we're told about tempest and wind, but there was apparently uh, rain. And, and again, remember, Baal worship. Baal, supposedly the god of nature, thunderstorms, lightning, and all that. Right. And it's like, here's Baal doing his little, and here's God. <laughs> <laughs> so let's just remember who we're dealing with here, shall we? Um, and then with that as a background, she then flashes to her own day. In the days of Shamgar, the son of Anath. Now, we, we, we talked about him a little last time. He gets one verse in uh, <laughs> the end of chapter three. After him was Shamgar, the son of Anath, which slew of the Philistines 600 men with an ox goat. He also delivered Israel. 
He's in the list of judges, so presumably a judge, spirit-filled. We're not told whether he killed those 600 at one time or in groups and pieces over some period of weeks or months. It doesn't matter. The fact is, he looked innocent. He looked harmless. He's a farmer. Just move, excuse me, moving his oxen along with a goat until the soldiers pass. And then, with their backs safely turned, he goes after them and shish kebabs them. Um, it does say 600 men, which is... I, I'm glad that it has the units of what 600 <laughs> there were, because I always remember the fairy tale of seven at one blow, and the man who was famous for killing seven at one blow, and it was seven flies with a flick of his handkerchief. <laughs> so, 600 men. Know. Yes, yes. Sorry, that yeah, was I don't, a, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know the fairy tale. <laughs> um, so uh, Deborah points to Shamgar, who was working in the south, in the tribes of Judah. The The word Am, uh, Anath is the name of a pagan fertility goddess, um, which suggests that he was a convert, perhaps, uh, or from a town that was still heavily into Canaanite demon worship. So he, he somehow he's been rescued out of that, he and, or his family. And he presents as the unexpected. So much of Judges about, is about the mm -hmm. unexpected, the unlikely, the surprise hero that mm -hmm. comes out of nowhere, like jail. <clears throat> they both use sharp, pointy things, I think, as you pointed out last time. So it's the days of Shamgar. Everyone knew about Shamgar. In the days of jail. So she takes jail and elevates her to the level of this judge and names the era after her as well. One in the south, one in the north. She doesn't call it my age. She was a prophetess. She, she could have done that without vanity or pride. Doesn't assign it to Barak, although he performed great service in all of this as a general. She singles out Jael, who delivered the blow, crushed the serpent's head. Not to say that Jael is a type of Christ, but she is the woman that God uses. And there is much in scripture about the bride also crushing the serpent's head. Christ does the definitive crushing. And yet Paul writes to the Church of Rome, may uh, God crush Satan under your heel shortly. Mm -hmm. So we we follow him <clears throat> in the crushing. And, and here she is doing that as a mom, as a wife, as one of, one of the females who is very loyal and very brave, even though she's an outsider. She technically doesn't, she's not genetically descended from, um, from Israel, although from, uh, is from Abraham. So JL, am I right in looking at this and saying JA is Yah and EL is uh, You would think, but as I remember, <laughs> yeah, you would think, but as I remember, no, I think it's no, a, okay. um, it's an outside name, okay. um, but we could, we could check for next time. Um, anyway, in their days, the highways were unoccupied and the travelers walked through the byways. The inhabitants of the village ceased. They ceased in Israel. So it's a time when pagan oppression is so strong that people are afraid to go out and travel the roads. Commerce has died off. People are sneaking along through back ways. Um, black market prospers, you know, in forest glens and in back corners because you don't want to take your stuff out of the open because the Canaanite soldiers are going to come and steal it. Uh, I am reminded of, um, some of Agatha Christie's novels set during the rationing in Britain. There's one mm. plot point in one in one of her books where people are sneaking out at night into the shed in the back, and who knows what they're doing? What they're doing is buying sugar and chocolate from under the <laughs> cakes because it's illegal because of the rationing. Um, and, and there was something else that came to mind, but it doesn't matter. You get the idea. Mm -hmm. uh, until that I, Deborah, arose. I arose a mother in Israel. And there's her title. She, she does not hesitate to give herself the, her own due. God has used her. And it's it's not wrong to say, yeah, God did this thing. And yes, by the way, I was in fact the instrument at this point in this time, not taking glory away from God, but simply recognizing that God used this person to a degree here and there. A mother in Israel. We're going to talk more about, we'll talk continue to talk about this today and talk about it more. Next week, or what about it? What it means to be a mother? At the, at the very least, it means to nurture the next generation. It means a whole lot more than that. But let's let's just kind of keep that in mind as we go toward the end, and we see Deborah as one sort of mother, and we see Sisera's mom as a very different sort of mother, and and the difference 
be the, what kind of mom you are makes for the future. So she arises a mother in Israel. They chose new gods. See, Israel was not faithful. When the, when the powerful people are in authority and they're oppressing and questioning you, it's easy to switch over to their side and, and adopt their values. Like we've never seen anything like that in America in recent years where Christians actually switch sides and start using the language of unbelievers. <laughs> I wish. <clears throat> um, then there was war in the gates. Well, when we abandon the Lord, then yeah, war comes. Was there a shield or spear seen among 40,000 in Israel? They had, the Canaanites had deliberately disarmed Israel. We see this later um, in Judah in the book of Samuel where the Philistines made sure that, is, that Judah had no iron weapons, no swords and spears and things. First step of tyrants, get rid of their weapons. Make sure that they are not an effective fighting force. My heart is toward the governors of Israel that offered themselves willingly among the people. Bless ye the Lord. So again, she comes back to this idea that there were some people who saw the, saw the conflict, saw the need, and willingly offered themselves. And some of them were became what we would think of as common footmen in a, in, in a war, although they had clubs and not swords. But some of them were governors, were rulers. Uh, they, they, they could have stayed back and said, yeah, you guys go, go, go attack, go attack, go fight. We're with you, sort of. We're all in this together, but you go fight and we'll stay here. Uh, they actually were all in it together. They actually got involved in the messy battle, according to their skill, we're going to see. Speak, ye that ride on white asses, ye that sit in judgment by the way. Uh, those are rulers. They're the ones who drive around in limousines, white donkeys. They that are delivered from the noise of the archer in the places of drawing water, there they shall rehearse the righteous acts of the Lord, even the righteous acts toward the inhabitants of the villages in Israel. Then shall the people of the Lord go down to the gates. She's predicting that... Um, in the future at the watering holes, when the women go out to get the water and and do what people do when they're, you know, sharing their comments, they're going to talk, <laughs> but they're not, it's not going to be gossip. They're going to go out there and they're going to say, you hear the great thing that God did for us. And my husband was in that battle. He said that this, this storm came out of nowhere. Isn't God great? He's so much greater than that. That's the kind of talk that's going to go on at the watering holes. <laughs> And, and we're going to see, and, and part of the talk is, yes, wasn't it great that our tribe was? Yes, too bad that other tribe wasn't. Hmm. Awake, awake, Deborah, awake, awake. Utter a song, arise, Barak, and lead thy captivity captive, thou son of Obinoam. Leading captivity captive. That's a phrase we're going to see in Ephesians. You have uh, handle running through my head now. <laughs> uh, spoken of Jesus, he will... Lead captivity captive. Then he made, then he made him that remaineth have dominion over the nobles among the people. The Lord made me have dominion over the mighty. God put Deborah in charge. <clears throat> it was time, such a time as this, and that brings us, of course, back to Queen Esther, who again, at a crucial moment, put herself out there to save God's people. Out of Ephraim there was a root of them against Amalek, and here's just a list of the tribes that that involved and those that didn't. Uh, after thee, Benjamin, among the people, out of Maker, that's Manasseh, uh, came down governors, and out of Zebulun, they that handled the pen of the writer. And the princes of Issachar were with Deborah, even Issachar, also Barak. He was sent on foot into the valley. So a number of tribes got involved real fast. Now, uh, Issachar was the lead tribe because that was Barak's tribe. It was also where Deborah was living at the time. So they're involved, but the others came too. We're told that the... Um, uh, those of Zebulun, the, those that handle the pen of a writer. You know, you need scribes. <laughs> War runs on paper. It's, you know, that's the reality of it. And so these guys may not have been great in the battlefield, but they came and gave what they had. <laughs> and they were the office officials, and they were the recorders, and they were the messengers, and they were the ones who drew up the maps, and whatever else had to be done to make this thing work. And, and Deborah puts them among everybody else. But that then, reminds me of Hamilton, one of the big points of the musical, their artistic flair mm -hmm. is that they're equating the bullets firing across the battlefield with the letters that are shooting back and forth. <laughs> and there is truth yeah, in this. Definitely. There is. 
But then she turns to the tribe of Reuben. Now, Reuben was descended from Jacob's firstborn son, Reuben. And the Reubenites had always kind of wanted to be the lead because, you know, firstborn and all that. <laughs> but because of Reuben's personal sin, incest with his, what would it be, stepmom? Anyway, Jacob's concubine. He got demoted. And there are a few times when Reuben tries to be aggressive and tries to take the lead. And it never works. <laughs> Reuben is too incompetent even to rebel, really. Which is fine. Once you realize it's your limitations, it just won't work. <laughs> you could, God can still use you. But here they they got too wrapped up. They, they wanted they wanted to be profound and failed. For the divisions of Reuben, there were great thoughts of heart. They thought really hard about this one. They meditated. You can think of the constant or the um, the Second Continental Congress. <laughs> the 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 arguments back and forth about do we fight or don't we? <clears throat> do we open or... the windows or will that let in too many <clears throat> flies? Yeah, yeah. Do we call a pastor or will that convince everybody that we're um, we're divided? Mm. So this they're going back and forth, and she goes on. Why abodest thou among the sheepfolds to hear the bleatings of the flocks? Apparently they were shepherds. For the divisions of Reuben, there were great searchings of heart. They're still thinking, they're still sitting there trying to figure out what they should do. They're really thinking, they are thinking hard about this one. They are arguing it, they're meditating on it, and they're doing absolutely nothing. <laughs> and this is what's going to be recited at the watering holes for the next ever generations. But that's not fair to later generations. It's a nice warning. Not everybody gets warned that you had ancestors who were complete, complete <laughs> compromisers. Don't be like them. Ooh. Mm. Of course, we would have liked the other, but you know we can't go right back and re rewrite our ancestors, but we can learn from them and their failures. Why abodest thou among the sheepfolds to hear the bleedings of the flocks for the divisions of Reuben? There were great searchings of heart. Gilead abode beyond Jordan. <clears throat> Why did Dan remain in the ships? Asher continued on the seashore and abode in the breaches. Zebulun and Naphtali. So those are, the, again, the tribes that didn't do anything. And their names and their failures are going to be recited in this song at the watering holes. Night entertainments, folk desks, festivals, and all that from now on. And, you know, there were, you couldn't go to court and get an injunction in those days and say, they're saying nasty things about me. Can you make them stop? <laughs> no, this is the word of the Lord. In fact, this may have been sung in synagogues as well. That's just, it happened. Deal with the historical reality. Uh, Zebulun and Naphtali were the people that, that uh, jeopardize, jeopardize their lives unto death in the high places of the field. I said earlier that uh, the Barak was from um, Issachar. Deborah, I think, was from Issachar. At least she's connected with them. Barak was from Naphtali, which is where his city is. It was a, pre, it was a, a city Levitical of refuge. City. Levitical city, yeah. Uh, but these tribes, these tribes were the boundary tribes of the Sea of Galilee to the south. And we've already seen... Isaiah's prophecy that this this has messianic overtones. Uh, in the land around Galilee, there is this flash of light. Well, historically, it was Barak who comes and delivers the people from Canaanites and rescues the promise. Of course, in the New Testament, that finds final fulfillment in Jesus, who begins his ministry in Galilee. Actually, he was born in Galilee, in Nazareth. And, uh, well, born in Bethlehem. I'm sorry, born in Bethlehem. Yeah. Conceived in Nazareth, raised in <laughs> yeah. Nazareth, born in Bethlehem. Um, <laughs> Called out of we, Egypt. Yeah, met and um, all that. But he begins his ministry there, and Matthew records the people who sat in, dark, saw, sat in darkness saw a great light, quoting from Isaiah chapter 9. So we're to think of that. Zebulun and Naphtali were a people that jeoparded their lives unto death in the high places of the field. So she praises the, the tribes who were right there. It's okay to praise the people who did right. Can't say, oh, you should be humble enough not to need praise. God's people need encouragement, and we need to be told, yeah, these are the guys who did it right. Well, what does that mean about us? Hmm. <laughs> I don't know. Were you there too? And then it shifts. They fought from heaven. Oh, I'm sorry, verse 19. Then the kings came and fought. Then fought the kings of Canaan and Tanakh by the waters of Megiddo, Armageddon. They took no gain of money. They weren't in it for the money. They were in it to exterminate God's people because now God's people had raised their heads and now they're going to stomp them down real good once and for all. So this was a fight to the death. They fought 
from heaven. The stars in their courses fought against Sisera. That's an ambiguous passage and probably deliberately so. Mm -hmm. Does it mean that there were meteor showers that rained down on the enemy? That's a possibility. In one fictional account I was describing with someone, I used it that way. But it may be a little more remote. It just means that the whole cosmos was orchestrated against Sisera. Um, Astarte, Ashtaroth, is supposed to be the star Venus, the brightest of stars. But here, no, the stars are not on your side. Nature is not on your side. Nature is not a thing. There is God in his providential control of creation, and God is using everything against you. And it, it, it's possible that when we get to heaven and hear the stories of this battle, we may find out that there was a whole lot more in nature that warred against Sisera than we have any conception of. Oh, oh where'd that root come from? <laughs> Ow, that raindrop hit me right in the eye. Wow, that mud puddle wasn't there a minute ago. You know, just <laughs> things, the, the whole world was against them in the most literal sense. Because when God is your enemy, there's no place to hide. <laughs> The, and, and notice they fought against Sisera, not just against the Canaanite army. It's personified here. There's one. Yeah, they're all guilty to some extent, but there's one guy who is the Antichrist at this moment. There is one guy who is the enemy. And the whole or, the whole universe is orchestrated against him. How's that? <laughs> to be the one person, the one man who for a moment, the whole universe turns on and says, we're out to get you and we're coming now. Uh, he's supposed to be really afraid. Of course, he's dead by now, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, the river Kishan swept them away. We weren't, we weren't told earlier exactly what happened. But now we begin to understand God dumped an awful lot of water into that uh, river plain. And the waters just overwhelmed the Canaanites with their chariots, mired the chariots and the horses. Horses went crazy. Chariots wouldn't move. Horses began to stomp and stamp wherever they could. The river Kishon swept them away. That ancient river, the river Kishon, oh my soul, thou hast trodden down strength. And then were the horses broken by means of the prancings, the prancings of their mighty ones. And then she inserts this. Kershi Meras, said the angel of the Lord. Now, we don't know exactly what or where Meras was. It was apparently a village or town somewhere near the battlefield. It was Israelite. And the angel of the Lord says, Curse ye bitterly the inhabitants thereof, because they came not to the help of the Lord, to the help of the Lord against the mighty. <laughs> Surely the Lord doesn't need our help, so we shouldn't <laughs> have to lift a finger. Right. God's got this covered. We can just stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, right? You know, well, there are times when God tells you to do that. And there are other times where he says, get out there and fight. Mm -hmm. And a general summons to war had been given. They knew better. They just didn't want to. It was scary. They, they, they could die. And there's no record that everybody who, every Israelite who went out faithfully came back alive. People die in war. Sometimes the good people die in war. And these people just didn't want to be part of that. So they were just going to sit it out and they'll, they'll inherit whatever they inherit on the other side. If, if the bad guys win, they could say, hey, we didn't do anything. If the good guys win, ah, isn't it great to be an Israelite? Isn't God wonderful how he... Raises up people to rescue us. And God's response is no. No. But what, what's more stinging is not simply that God said it or that the prophetess said it. If it was just the prophetess, people would try to find ways around it. <laughs> but she says, the angel of the Lord. Now, anybody who studied Old Testament theology knows the angel of the Lord is Messiah. It's Jesus, the son of God in his pre-incarnate revelation as the angel or messenger of the covenant. So this is not some random angel. This is not Deborah with an attitude after a bad day. This is Jesus saying, curse this village because they didn't help when they were supposed to. Now, we're not told what the outworking of that curse is exactly, but it's significant enough that Jesus places it in scripture to let us know that there are times when if you're not with him, you're against him. Words he will use himself when he's on earth. Uh, when it's a battle between Christ and demons, you have to pick a side. You don't get to be neutral. You don't get to wait it out and see who wins. You don't get to let other people fight your battles. You must be involved to the level of your ability. We saw that was it, uh, the people of Zebulun, some of them could only write. God used that. God honored that. They did what they could. God honored it. Here was a village. We don't know that they could have done much, but they refused to try to do anything. 
when the fate of the world was hanging in the balance. And so Jesus curses them through his, prof his prophetess. And now we come to, to the description of two women. We've already seen one of them, Jael. So a lot of this is repetitive for us. Blessed above women shall Jael, the wife of Heber the Canaanite, be blessed shall she be above women in the tent. And as we saw last week, there's only one other woman in all of Scripture and all of history of whom God has ever said that, and that's the Virgin Mary. And when Gabriel pronounced those words, he knew the text, more to the point, God knew the text, having inspired Deborah to say it, and the connection's deliberate. It, it won't do to say that, well, Deborah felt that way, but God had different ideas. No, <laughs> this, is, this is divine prophecy. You wouldn't do that to any other prophet. Wouldn't treat Isaiah or Jeremiah that way. Uh, jail for her active obedience, for actively siding against the enemy. Think of Rahab, changing sides, committing treason, and in this case, defying her husband and his poor political choices and poor religious commitments, because that's ultimately what mm -hmm. political choice was then and now. It just was a little more obvious then. Mm -hmm. She's honored. And this is, and, and no other woman gets this kind of accolade until Mary who also suffered from a great deal of misunderstanding and persecution. And Mary, you know what? She's pregnant. Well, I always thought she was a little too good for him. You know, all of that, the gossip over the fences of Nazareth. Uh, and the sword that would pierce her own heart when her son died. But now back to, to jail. He, Sisera, asked water. She gave him milk. Uh, water in the traditions of the day would have sealed her responsibility as a hostess. Now, she could still defy tradition, obviously. But rather than give the water, she gives milk, yo yogurt. <laughs> she treats him like a baby. She gives him baby food. Also, I mean, you could say, well, it's more nutritious. But it also <laughs> got her out of that situation where she was committing herself as a host. I mean, yeah, <laughs> that's it's heaping burning coals in a way. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. Uh, she gave him milk. She brought forth butter in a lordly dish. She, she throws in all the trappings. She put her hand to the nail and her right hand to the workman's hammer. And with a hammer, she smote Sisera. She smote off his head when she had pierced and stricken through the temples. And then this repetitive poetic language. At her feet he bowed, he fell, he lay down. At her feet he bowed, he fell. Where he bowed, there he fell down dead. Now, given what Deborah has just said, it, it doesn't seem likely that he actually literally did those things. Because he, he was sleeping and she did one pound that shattered his, his temple. So he didn't probably have a lot of chance to... You know, reach up and grab her robe and pull herself up and go up and down and maybe, but I, it seems that the that Deborah is picking these words because bowing down on a woman, falling on a woman, lying with a woman, these are all words that normally are used for sexual intercourse. Mm -hmm. But in this case, this man who is used to raping women gets it. <laughs> And again, many people have pointed out the uh, phallic nature of the uh, tin peg. Uh, he's he, he an eye for an eye or something for something. Uh, <laughs> well, it's it kind of reminds us back back when we were talking about the um, the civil consequences for mm -hmm. rape, where it's compared to murder. The Bible says, yeah. because this is like killing a man. Right. There's no fixing right. it. Yeah, it's, yeah, 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 and so we go on, and well, there he he doesn't go on; he's dead, right. and that's what Deborah's <laughs> celebrating. He ki she killed jail, killed him dead, D E D. You know, it's it's over. And again, there are many Christians who, well, that's not nice. That's not loving. Shouldn't shouldn't she have witnessed to him or something? No, <laughs> pearls before swine and all that. There are times when yes, you try to win the enemy to Christ. There are times when you realize that's not going to happen here. Well, you don't know that. Yeah, I actually kind of do. Um, <laughs> I know what my job is in this situation. <laughs> yes, I understand the job. If, if as he's dying, he wants to call out to God, that's great. And I'll welcome him in heaven when we get there. <laughs> but in the meantime, I have a job to do. And that job is to eliminate the Antichrist from the face of the earth 
because I'm the one who's here. I'm the one who has the best shot. And again, this was a terribly bold and brave act of hers. And there was no guarantee this was going to work. And if she missed, if she if she scuffed her feet too loud and he woke up, it was all over. Not only would he kill her, but he'd probably do some really nasty things before and after. So th this, this was a tremendously courageous act on her part. And the, the grief she's gotten from it for commentators is ridiculous. Well, then we shift. And Deborah, with prophetic vision, sees what's going on on the other side. Uh... In, uh, in the Canaanite city where Sisera's mom lives. The mother of Sisera looked out at a window and cried through the lattice. There wouldn't be glass, It'd just be a, a lattice in an open window. And, and what is she crying? Why is his chariot so long in coming? Why tarry the wheels of his chariots? Why isn't the army back? It's so late. How long could it take to mop up that, that, <laughs> that rabble. I mean, it's. I'm getting a little worried about him. It's almost tea time. It is, yes. We have his favorite napkin here. His favorite cup. Her wise ladies answered, and the Hebrew word for ladies is the idea of princes or noble women. So this, this is. these are the other noble people who would have had also sons or nephews or younger brothers or whatever in the army. They're all together waiting for the army to return to hear the good report. And they answer, yea, she returned to answer to herself. Have they not spent, I'm sure they're going as fast as they can. Have they not divided the prey? They're busy doing the spoiling. They've already defeated those people, those nasty people. And surely they're, it, it, maybe it just takes time. They don't, it's not like they would have a lot on them. They have to care, search the bodies really carefully. Make sure they don't leave anything behind. And um, and then they say this. They've divided the prey to every man a damsel or two. Now, in Elizabethan English, that should already be shocking. Mm -hmm. That the prey they're dividing are the girls, the young girls. Now, we might sanitize that by saying, oh, they're just picking out slave girls. Well, yes. But that's the sanitized version. Like <laughs> that's, that's bad enough, right? <laughs> yeah, that would be bad enough if it were true. But that's mm -hmm. not actually what the Hebrew word says. The Hebrew word for damsel is not at all damsel. And there's a very appropriate word for damsel. The word is uterus or womb. Um, I'm sure there are Anglo-Saxon words, which I don't know, praise God, that describe female private parts. And that's kind of what this woman is saying. Mm -hmm. That she's reducing these Hebrew women to a, a piece of anatomy. Uh, in other words, they're busy raping the women. I'm sure when they're done with that, you know, that takes a while. And I'm sure when they're done with that, they'll be home as soon as they can. And then we'll have a nice round of uh, slaves, uh, half Canaanite, half Hebrew, for the next generation. This is, again, the serpent trying to take possession of the bride and bring forth his seed through her. Uh, and again, back this to Genesis is... Three. Deborah singing this song. Yeah. This is a woman. This is a Using woman. very crude language, we would say today. <laughs> yeah. I, I think. Very blunt. Yeah. And yeah. Well, nice women don't talk like that. <laughs> Victorious women do. <laughs> yeah. There's, there's, there's no time for, um, for, for being nice neo-Victorian here. Or pre-Victorian in her case. Uh. They've devised to every man a damsel or two to Sisera, a prey of diverse colors, a prey of diverse colors of needlework, of diverse colors of needlework on both sides. Meet for the next of them to take the spell. Notice that women are just really dropped in in the midst of, and oh, and also I'm sure he's bringing something pretty home too. Maybe <laughs> some kind of nice refined, I hear those Hebrew women do nice needlework. I bet they've got some of that too. How we look forward to that. And the women just become one more thing on the list. A thing. To, be to these other place. women, too. To other women. That's the and that's the whole point here. Mm -hmm. These are not the soldiers. This is not the Antichrist. This is the Antichrist mom. Mm -hmm. And now we understand how he got to be what he is. <laughs> this is this was her attitude toward other women who were not of her sort. She probably would be horrified if Canaanite women, or at least the noble Canaanite women, were treated this way. But to her, it's a matter of course that those people over there should be treated that way, that rabble. That ragtag bunch. Yeah, of course you do that. That's what war's for, isn't it? And in collecting other neat treasures, I'll bring you, I bet he brought you home something special, dear. I'm sure he would. He's a thoughtful son. 
And so the stark contrast here, the sarcasm and the irony just drips off the page. And again, in our sanitized generation, that offends us. Well, that's not loving and kind. Get over yourselves. This is the divinely inspired prophetess telling it like it is. These are wicked women who produce wicked sons, and God brought judgment that was final. And so she turns now back to God and says, So let all thine enemies perish, O Lord. It's universal. If people are going to continue to oppose themselves to God and his kingdom and to the promise of Messiah, they need to be destroyed just as efficiently, effectively, and permanently as Sisera and his host. Now, that doesn't mean you have to go on being an enemy of God. There mm -hmm. is repentance. There is mm -hmm. a gospel message that though we have been enemies, we can be reconciled to God through the death of his son. But there comes a day when time runs out. There comes a day when wisdom will no longer cry aloud. There comes a time when God will not give you repentance. And that's a frightening time. But let them but uh but let them that love him, that love God, be as the sun when he goeth forth in his might. An image that's used a number of times in scripture, but particularly relevant in Judges, Samson, whose name means the sun. Hmm. And so we get a peek ahead to what's coming. Uh, what she has begun here in the north, Samson's going to continue in the south. God's not done yet. The battle goes on. And it will go on until Jesus comes. Then it will be definitively won. Jesus will definitively win it. And then there'll be the mopping up operation, which we're still engaged in, and which is still a war. And sometimes we need to be reminded of that as we have brothers and sisters in Christ across the world who are being executed and imprisoned for the name of Christ. We need to get past the point of saying... Well, you know, it's my religion, but I wouldn't impose it on anybody else. Yeah. <laughs> well, the rest of the world tries to impose their religion by very bloody, forceful means. And we're beginning to see it in our country. Mm -hmm. where We will not maintain our freedoms long until we at least get the idea of this is life and death. It's black and white. And whereas the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, we're not called to take out assault weapons or... 45s and go shoot down the bad guys. We are called to stand for Christ, to draw the line in the sand and say, this is true and that's lies. And we're not budging. And we're going to call spade a spade and we're going to call sin sin. And we're going to explore, we're going to offer you the gospel plainly. And you don't like it, we're not surprised. It doesn't change anything. Mm -hmm. So that is an optimistic note, whether we think of it that way. <laughs> Our culture doesn't think that that's optimistic. Mm -hmm. No, but if it's not nice and pleasant, there are no puppies and rainbows. No. <laughs> There's a rainbow at the end. It's around the throne of God. <laughs> yeah. I love that. We should make that a tagline. <laughs> There's a rainbow at the end. It's around the throne of God. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, shall we close up with some recommendations? I can recommend a short little collection of school essays ostensibly written by about a 10-year-old girl. <laughs> what is her name? I, I lent you the book, so I don't have it in front of me. Virginia Carey Hudson or something like that? Yeah, I believe that's right. And this is back in the days when you would go to school and the teacher would say, all right, write on your slate an essay on this topic. And so there's an essay on the sacraments. There's an essay on etiquette. There's an essay on personal appearance. And you get it all through the eyes of this 10-year-old girl who is growing up Episcopalian in the Carolinas somewhere in around 1910. And uh, I, that makes it sound very boring, but it is a hoot and a holler. <laughs> like, Just imagine I, how yeah. children see things when they're not explained. Yeah. Especially, especially church traditions and family traditions. Just leave it to them to figure out what in the world's going on. Yeah. yeah they, they come up with interesting explanations. Mm -hmm. And this young lady, apparently 10, so all of the, uh, the sources say, was very clear in her language and very inaccurate in all that she said, <laughs> but it was true from her point of view, at least. Yeah. Some things she says more. are really great. Like when she talks about, you know, certain things about in church, how you don't uh, you don't walk loudly down the aisle, you have to tiptoe yeah. and... It's not that Jesus minds, but other people might. <laughs> I was like, that's very true. <laughs> no, no. So that's um, my recommendation. Again, it's called Oh Ye Jigs and Juleps. Uh, I'm going to uh, borrow from what you mentioned earlier. 
Jeeves and Wooster, mm. the <laughs> made for television movie, I guess, um, BBC series back in the what? 80s, oh. 90s? Oh, 90s, probably. Yeah. It's a young Stephen Fry and Hugh Laurie. Yeah, wonderful comedic team together mm -hmm. based on the works of Wodehouse. Uh, this is where the idea of the butler named Jeeves originally came from, which <laughs> was a staple in my generation. This generation probably, oh, but Jeeves, butler, what? I don't even know what a butler is. But we have the the very efficient, very intelligent, very nearly supernaturally equipped butler <laughs> yeah. who comes to the rescue of this complete lamer who has lots of money in a title but can't take care of himself in the slightest way and how they work together to get out of really ridiculous situations. Usually involving and, matrimony to some undesirable woman. <laughs> yes. <laughs> not, 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 not that Bernie Wooster is all that desirable himself, but you know. <laughs> they so all good. want to take pity on him and take him in yeah. hand and make something yes. of him. <laughs> make something of him, exactly. <laughs> yeah. What, what do you think of work? Work? Well, uh, work is fascinating. I can, I, I can watch it for hours. Um, <laughs> yeah. I had a friend who had a job once. <laughs> yeah. And, oh, and then the Bernie's use of names for his friends. Oh, yes. Because what comes after that is the name of, I don't remember who, yeah. but the, the, these, these long nicknames for people who, in fact, are lords <laughs> in British culture, but they have these stupid monikers that have been plastered mm -hmm. on them, and we can't take anybody seriously <laughs> in this. It is, it is a lot of fun. So. Oh, yeah. And, and it reflects the remnants of a Christian society in, in Britain in the um, whenever it's at uh, <laughs> early 1900s, I should imagine. Uh, 20s, I think. 1920s. Yeah. Okay. There we go. You you take the you get the book, you get the, you watch the movie, enjoy the 1920s for a little while, both in England and America. Mm -hmm. Great weekend entertainment. Yeah, it is a phenomenal adaptation too. Oh, and absolutely. the source material, uh, I. I keep saying this, I'm sure I'm accidentally quoting somebody, but P.G. Woodhouse really is the last word in English style. It's yeah. just, you can't beat it. It's yeah. the comedic, everything about it is perfect. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for this conversation. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. It's nice to give some lighthearted recommendations after yeah. that <laughs> conversation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, thanks also to David, our producer, and my lawfully wedded husband. Uh, thanks to you, our listeners. We appreciate you tuning in. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can send us an email at haltingtowardszion at gmail.com. You can subscribe to us on YouTube, Rumble, or your favorite podcast catcher. You can like our Facebook page. And if you'd like to support us financially, you can visit our website, anchor.fm slash halting towards Zion. Thank you so much to our financial supporters. We really appreciate you. All right, and we hope to see you next week. Have a good night.